When you're learning metabolism, don't try to just memorize everything. Instead, focus on the core concepts and the basic logical principles. Those same logical principles are going to play out over and over and over again. No matter how complex a metabolic pathway or a metabolic chart might look, you can follow things along. You can rely on using those principles to help you understand what's going on, predict what's going on, and really understand at a deep level what's going on, even if things from the outside look super duper confusing. So rather than memorize, conceptualize. Some of the things to focus on, well, what do you want to happen where? So know what each main metabolic process gives you. So like glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis, um, uh, well, the pentose phosphate pathway, beta oxidation, lipogenesis. There's so many different pathways. Um, but you can kind of think about what are the products of those pathways and therefore like when would you want to do what? Then then think about kind of where would you want to do them? So different tissues are going to have different needs and different wants and different functions. In, when you learn metabolism, you typically focus on the liver and the muscles. The liver, because it serves as kind of this general coordination hub for metabolism, it's kind of like a warehouse where it's going to hold on to energy and it's going to provide energy to the rest of the body. So things kind of first get through into your body. They like, kind of like first stop is the liver. Your liver is going to kind of process things and be like, okay, let's store this as fat. Let's store this as glycogen. Let's give some glucose to the tissues. Let's give some fat to the tissues. Um, let's give some proteins. Okay, now let's hold on to some of this stuff. And then when, when the tools, tissues are running out of fuel, we'll send them some. So your liver has this key role of kind of regulating the food throughout the body and regulating the blood sugar, responding, gain, giving out glucose when the blood sugar drops low and taking in glucose when it's high, things like that. The muscles, well, they're just kind of like a nice little opposite to the liver in a way. So a good kind of counterbalancing example to think about what would happen in, the, in different tissues under different scenarios. For example, your liver has to regulate the blood glucose, but your muscles just have to contract and stuff. So in response to, to adrenaline, your liver is going to make up or free glucose and ship it out. Whereas the muscles, well, they're just going to burn the glucose that they free up. So remember that the liver, basically, it can do gluconeogenesis or it can do glycogenolysis and it has G6PAs. So it can actually dephosphorylate glucose 6-phosphate to a form to glucose, which can actually leave the cells. But your muscles, although they can do glycogenolysis, they can break down glycogen, they can't even dephosphorylate it, so they can't free up glucose all the way, and so they can't even release glucose, so they get to keep it for themselves. So your, your muscles get to be hoggy of the glucose they make, um, selfish, whereas your liver is going to be more generous and send things out. This brings you to, well, yeah, we need to know which main metabolic processes can and can't happen in which tissues. For example, only your liver and kidneys can do gluconeogenesis, but as we just talked about, the liver and the muscles can both do glycogenolysis, so they can both break down glycogen. Also, like your red blood cells, your erythrocytes, they don't even have mitochondria, so they can't do the electron transport chain. This kind of gets into, well, what are the fuel preferences of different tissues? For example, your liver is going to prefer fatty acids, which is going to prevent it from hogging all the glucose it needs to provide to the other tissues. However, your red blood cells, well, they're not going to prepare fatty acids because they can't even do beta oxidation because they don't have mitochondria. So they're going to really want the glucose. So now we know that what we kind of like want to happen where, well, how is that actually going to happen? We can think about this in multiple senses. So one thing to denote, to get you really used to is to get comfortable tracking arrows on metabolic charts. Metabolic charts are daunting when you first see them. But really, it's kind of just like one of those puzzles that you puzzles that you see like they have in those like ki kids coloring books that they give to the kids when you go out to a restaurant and they want to keep the kids occupied so they're not just like driving their parents crazy. And they have those things where you like they have all the different pathways and then you have to follow the pathways with like your crayon and stuff and see which one goes where. It's similar to that. That's like what you need to do with a metabolic chart. Start at one molecule and follow the arrows to see where it takes you. That's going to kind of allow you to follow the bigger picture. 
And then you can think about what are the kind of main types of metabolic chemical reactions that are happening along the way. Although there are tons and tons of different variations of these reactions, just like we you saw in when you took organic chemistry, there were like tons and tons of variations of the same sorts of reactions of your SN2, your SN1, your electrophilic aromatic substitution, all that stuff. Like if you try to memorize each of the different individual circuit reactions in terms of um, each instance of it, that would be basically impossible and you would find it not fun at all. But if you focus on kind of tracking the electrons, recognizing the basic principles, well, now you can apply that to all sorts of new reactions. And it's not only fun, but it's also going to be a lot easier. Similarly, in biochemistry, those same sorts of principles apply in terms of tracking electrons, thinking about nucleophiles and electrophiles, and then kind of recognizing that these, there's these key kind of main types of reactions that are going to happen with different molecules, yes, but in largely the same manner in all over the place. These are things like phosphorylation and dephosphorylation, other hydrolysis reactions, condensation, isomerization, carboxylation, decarboxylation, oxidation, reduction. Um, so lots of different names. But again, if you just think back to the actual core, the principles of nucleophile, electrophile, electron flow, all of those still hold. One thing that's going to help you recognize what kind of reaction is happening is going to be to look for the cofactors. For example, NAD um, and FAD, NADP, these are going to tell you if you have like an oxidation happening. NADH, FADH2, NADPH, well here you'd be dealing with a reduction. CoA, you often use this when you want to um, do things like introduce a linkage, swap, swap things from one carbon to another. TPP, PLP, when we're doing things where we want to kind of do some sorts of transamination or things. Biotin, when we want to do a carboxylation. So recognize these cofactors when they show up and therefore what what type of reaction you might be looking at when you see one of them on one of those charts. Know which processes happen in the mitochondria versus the cytoplasm. For example, the citric acid cycle as a whole happens in your mitochondria, whereas glycolysis happens in your cytoplasm. This then gets you to, well, which molecules can and can't interleave the mitochondria. For example, that NADH that you make in glycolysis can't actually enter the mitochondria, and this gets you to having to think about electron shuttles. Similarly, although oxaloacetate is produced in the TCA, and although oxaloacetate is a intermediate of gluconeogenesis, oxaloacetate can't leave the mitochondria, and therefore we have to take malate out of the mitochondria, convert it to oxaloacetate in the cytosol, and use that if we want to do gluconeogenesis. Similarly, CoA can't enter or leave, and so we take citrate out of the citric acid cycle in the mitochondria, take it to the cytoplasm, and there we convert it to acetyl-CoA if we want to make fatty acids. So now that we know about kind of like what we want to happen and where, now let's go about thinking, well, how does that actually happen where you want it to when you want it to? So just how we got comfortable with tracking the arrows, we also need to get comfortable with tracking the designations of inhibition and activation on metabolic charts. So focus on knowing the key points of enzymatic regulation. This actually gets back to those normal reaction arrows because you wanna think about whether the arrows are depicted as one way or two way. And sometimes if all you see are one way arrows on a diagram, they're probably just not showing which ones are two way and which ones are one way. Um, but if you see some of both, they're probably trying to indicate to you that some of them are readily reversible, whereas others are more metabolically, quote unquote, irreversible. Remember that nothing is truly irreversible. But when we say irreversible in metabolism, that's basically referring to something that has a really large negative delta G so that it's really, 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 really hard to go in reverse, practically impossible under physiological conditions. If you had some sort of artificial conditions where you were able to totally like add bazillion more of your products and your reactants, yeah, you could th get things to go back theoretically, but that's not going to happen in your body. These type of reactions, if you do get them to happen in the forward, like if they go forward, it's going to be basically impossible to go backwards. And therefore, you only want to go forwards if you really want to go forwards. And so you want to tightly regulate those steps. You can regulate them by regulating the enzyme itself. 
you're not going to regulate the directionality just by regulating the amounts of the products and reactants because you would have to skew them so, so far. You would have to get your Q and your um, your KEQ so, so out of whack that you would basically, it'd be impossible. And so instead of trying to control things by the concentrations, you control things by controlling the enzyme. The two kind of main ways that you can control the enzyme physically are allosteric and covalent. So your allosteric molecules are going to bind to an enzyme and change its activity. Whereas a covalent in, um, regulation, this is when you're doing something like phosphorylating an enzyme to change its activity. Allosteric molecules, these can be things like ATP, NADH, citrate, sesenol coa So they can be kind of cofactors. They can be um, signs of energy status, reduction status, or they can be intermediates in pathways. They allow for crosstalk between pathways as well as um, path feedback within a pathway that I'll talk about in a second. So know the main, main allosteric modulators. What does their presence indicate? So if you have a lot of ATP, it's telling you you've got a lot of energy, you've got a lot of AMP, well, now you don't have a lot of energy. Along those lines, well, what's going to be regulated by them and why does that make sense? So you'll see that a lot of the enzymes are regulated by these same sorts of ones, but it's kind of like a mix and match and allowing for combinatorial regulation. So some enzymes are going to be regulated by the same things, but then also by different things. And in this way, you're able to regulate each of these at kind of at the same time, but also separately from one another. So you might activate all of these things partway if you have a lot of energy, but then to you can further fine tune the regulation based on where that energy is coming from. Okay, so what are those enzymes that are regulated by it have in common and can chair and contrast the regulators of different enzymes? The other kind of main way we can control an enzyme is by altering it covalently, such as by adding a phosphoryl group. This is typically going to be associated with hormonal control. Know the main metabolism-associated hormones, like your insulin and your glucagon for most, um, are the two big ones that are going to regulate like your liver. When are they made? Where are they made? And do only certain tissues respond? So for example, glucagon, you're only your liver is going to respond to that glucagon and not your muscles, whereas both of them are going to respond to adrenaline. But thinking back to what we would want to happen where, your liver and your muscles are going to respond differently to that adrenaline because you're, um, because you're, they have different functions. And your muscles aren't going to respond to that glucagon. How is anything going to actually respond to those hormones, though, is typically through the activation of kinases and phosphatases. So know what which hormones activate what. So like glucagon and epinephrine, they're going to activate PKA, whereas insulin is going to activate AKT and um, protein phosphatase. One of the ways in which both your liver and your muscles can respond to the same sorts of stimulus, so both respond to adrenaline but have different responses, is because they have isozymes. So different versions of enzymes that are present in different tissues or compartments, so maybe in your mitochondria versus your cytoplasm, and they have different properties with regards to their activity or their regulation. So your liver has some different um, regulatory properties so that say some of the molecules in metabolism are actually going to be affected by PKA that wouldn't be affected in your lip, in your muscles, but that do get affected in your liver. And that way you can do things like um, shut off glycolysis in response to, um, to your adrenaline, your epinephrine in your liver based on inhibiting your pyruvate kinase, whereas you wouldn't want that to happen in your muscles. So you can have different isozymes that are regulated differently. These are kind of the physical ways in which the regulation can happen, but then you also want to think about, well, what kind of logic type of this regulation is it? So look for examples of feedback inhibition, where you prevent the backup when the enzymes down the line can't keep up. So this is when something further down the pathway, so like downstream, inhibit something upstream. Conversely, you can have feed forward to stimulation, which prepares the enzymes down the line for what's coming. So um, basically, if you're building up a lot of stuff upstream, well, let's make some more, get, hire some more people down the line in order to prepare. So for example, if you, you can think of it kind of like a business strategy. So if you have a lot of, you're getting a lot of new customers, maybe you want to hire some more people, but if you're, um, 
you have too many workers that are just sitting around doing nothing, well, maybe you need to fire some of them. Another type of regulation to keep an eye out is kind of like crosstalk between pathways. So for example, acetyl-CoA can be produced by the breakdown of pyruvate or by the breakdown of fatty acids. So you're going to want to have some kind of source crosstalk between those pathways in order to prevent you from making too much acetyl-CoA because you have to think about all the different places it's coming from, not just the one you're looking at right now, which gets you back to thinking about all of these pathways and being really comfortable with interpreting the charts. Because although you can't memorize everything, and I don't want you to memorize everything, you should be able to interpret the charts and look for these examples of these core principles. And you can really logic your way through a lot of complex situations.